So a while ago, I asked you what this was and how it could win a war. And I mean really win a war, a truly decisive weapon. So it's a really solid structure, yeah? Top comes off, you know, aluminium top. And inside you've got this thing that rocks around, right? Really very, very mobile. Um, and on one side it's got a load of fairly primitive electronics. So, the question is, what is it? Well, there were many answers. Most thought it was some sort of V2 rocket guidance system, and you can see why. It's made of aluminium to be light. It's got these gimbals and so forth. It's the sort of thing you might put in a rocket. However, no, not a bit of it. Indeed, arguably, this was a far more potent weapon than the V2. It had the potential to really stop World War II before it even started, winning the war for Nazi Germany. Because this is the trigger for the German magnetic mine. They found an aluminium dome set in a rubber diaphragm. But under the dome, a scale was revealed with the word Gauss. Gauss is the unit of magnetic measurement. The mine was magnetic. The mechanism was slung on gimbals in an aluminium frame. Indeed, by the end of the war, that's exactly what it was, a war winner. Apart from not for the Axis powers, but for the Allies. Now, you've got to understand something about modern war. Without fuel, you lose your ability to defend yourself incredibly quickly. You can't send your fleets out. You can't send your fighters up. You can't move your army around. And then very shortly after that, you lose the ability for mechanized farming. And if you live on an island with a population of about 50 million, and you can only grow enough food for about 5 million, you don't have to do much math to realize you're screwed. Now, Great Britain had known that for a long time, and historically, that was primarily the reason why Britain was so big on naval power. Because to be able to blockade England was to be able to defeat it, in principle, without firing a single shot. To a very large extent, Britannia had to rule the waves, else she was already beaten. Now, dropping contact mines to stop shipping had already had a long history by World War II. The problem was that by World War II, it was actually quite risky to go into foreign waters and lay these mines, and they were quite easy to sweep. Now, the Germans realized that typically a ship has a magnetic signature, and that an explosion underneath the ship tends to be far more damaging than an explosion against the side. And so, a mine left in relatively shallow water, such as, say, the coastal shipping lanes or in the river estuaries, could quite easily destroy a ship and all of its precious cargo within sight of its home port. And seeing as, at the time, such a mine was unsweepable, if Britain could not work out how to sweep such a mine before its fuel oil ran out, England was in every significant fashion already beaten. It's Sun Tzu's ultimate victory, to be able to win a war without fighting. And this was the weapon to do it. Now, bear in mind that this all happened in the year that France was defeated, but actually before either the US or Russia entered the war. Britain primarily stood alone against Germany. Britain very quickly realized that there was something funny going on, but unless they could work out how to defeat this mine, it was only a matter of time. And so they put their highest priority on actually finding a way to counter this new weapon that was blowing up all of their ships in coastal waters. Now, by extraordinary luck, quite literally, deliverance fell from the sky. The Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, had started dropping these mines from the air. And a German plane had flown down the Thames to drop a magnetic mine. It had been spotted, and a wall of anti-aircraft fire went up, and the crew panicked, dropped the mine early, and it landed on the mudflats. And the British went out to disarm and recover the mine. Now, disarming a mystery mine designed to blow up ships with an unknown triggering mechanism is a fairly ballsy activity. Yeah, it's true. Everyone is a general 
after the battle. But nonetheless, it still seems incredible that no one had stressed the potential war-winning importance of these mines to the German Air Force, and the importance of the British not being able to get their hands on one. All the Germans had to do was arm the mine, and then if it landed on land rather than water, it would explode. And later mines even had a failsafe such that if they were taken out of the water, they would explode. But instead, rather than risking getting their aircraft hit with this munition designed to blow up ships on board, they in many ways quite sensibly jettisoned it, but without even arming the failsafe. Ironically, they had not just delivered the mine into the hands of the English, they had done it safe. However, the air crew probably had no more realisation that they had just delivered the mechanism of not being blockaded into submission into the hands of their enemy than the poor guys marching towards this unknown ship-killing mine had that they were in no immediate danger. Unless, of course, they inadvertently took out the copper strips to arm the mine. If the mine had gone off Hoover and, and Baldwin had disappeared too, an explosion like that in that mud would, I should think, make a hole about a cricket pitch in diameter and about six or seven feet deep. Once the British had taken apart the mine and found out that it was magnetically triggered, it was now a technology race. Simply knowing how a weapon works is a small comfort if you can't work out how to counter it. If the British could not figure out a way to effectively sweep these mines, it was still only a matter of time before defeat was inevitable. And there are many cases like this in World War II where the entire outcome of the war could have been very different but for a handful of inventions. Early methods involved just putting huge electromagnets in minesweepers to try and set off these mines. However, that was rather a dangerous form of minesweeping with the minesweeper frequently damaged by the mines they were sweeping. Plus, when the Germans worked out this was what was going to happen, they just made some really insensitive magnetic mines specifically to blow up the minesweepers. But what really defeated the magnetic mine can be demonstrated on a kitchen table using a, a magnetized needle, a tub of seawater, a 12 volt battery charger, and a vintage ammeter. Now, it all boils down mm -hmm. to what I've got underneath my little vat of salt water here, which is a little needle. And that little needle's been magnetized very much like a compass needle. Uh, such that it points along the Earth's magnetic field. And what a lot of people worked out early on is that ships have a sort of residual magnetism to them, such that if the ship goes over the top, it really does mess with what the needle does. And that this was something that you could use in a triggering unit for a mine. Now, this needle on the bottom is basically the triggering mechanism for the magnetic mine. So as the ship passes overhead, there's a big perturbation, and boom, end of ship and its valuable cargo. What you really need is a way of making the sea magnetic. Well, it turns out there's a simple trick that can sort of do that. When you pass electricity around a loop, it generates a magnetic field. This is how solenoids work. The problem is, though, that dragging a whole loop like that behind a ship generates a lot of drag. What would be better if you could just drag, say, two straight wires behind a ship and then just use the conduction of the salt water to complete the circuit? And yeah, it worked. And so what I've got here is essentially a single L sweep set up. So I've got a positive and negative wire which come down the side of uh, the tub. They would actually be floating in the water in reality. And then you've just got them dipping into the, the salt water on either side. It's a bit green on the bottom because I've been electrolyzing stuff, and stuff, but that doesn't matter. When I pass current through this, there we go, that's passing current through. What you'll find is it electrolyzes the water. A load of bubbles at one of the electrodes. Yeah, I'm passing about half an amp through here. So let's see what effect actually passing that current down here through the water and back up the other side has um, underneath. Oh, you should find this when I pass cutting through this. It twitches the needle, you see. Now, obviously, they, they would actually pass enough current through these to just sell off the mine with a single loop, so they had much more powerful 
um, power sources than my mere 12 volt battery charger. Or more appropriately, it did work. It saved Britain's arse. Now I know there will be many who will say, but surely a weapon that you can demonstrate how to defeat on a kitchen table using a magnetic needle, some salt water, a few wires and a battery charger could never defeat a nation. Actually, yeah. The German magnetic mines were so good that they were copied by the Americans and used to devastating effect against Japan, which had no method of sweeping the mines. The operation, I kid you not, was called Operation Starvation, and it was hugely successful, arguably a war winner in itself, because just like England, Japan is another one of those islands where to be able to blockade the island is effectively to be able to defeat it. And this for me was one of the fascinating elements of World War II. It really was the first technologically driven war with time and time again technology proving the decisive tipping factor in entire campaigns were the apex of this technology able to make even the stoniest shift uncomfortably in their chair. Yet from this technological race arguably the most iconic event in the entire of human history was born. The second burn takes the crew of Apollo 8 where no men have ever been, deep space. There was no way that the Earth's gravity could hold us back any longer. 